Welcome back to Coffee with a Calvinist. My name is Keith Bosky, and I am a Calvinist. This is a daily Bible study to accompany your morning coffee. Today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 9. So if you want to open up your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 9, uh, as I've been saying each day, and if you've been keeping up, you know that I mentioned that these chapters in Luke are pretty long, and so we can't focus on everything that happens in the chapter. But my encouragement to you is read the whole chapter. Um, think about what it says. Write down questions that you may have. And I would encourage you, if you do have questions, put a question in the comments below, and I'll try to answer it as best as I can. And uh, if it's a question that re requires um, maybe a little bit more digging or a little bit more, uh, then I can respond in just a simple uh, comment. Perhaps I'll do a special edition based on your questions. So please remember that uh, I'm here to help, and I want to help you grow in your Bible study. But the part that I want to focus on today in Luke chapter 9 actually is verses 10 through 17. This is the feeding of the 5,000. This is an event that is one of the few events that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record the feeding of the 5,000, which uh, tells us a few things. One, it tells us that it was a, 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 an important event in the life of Christ, that it would be mentioned in all four Gospels. Um, and that it that it was that it was recognized uh, universally as something that Jesus did that made a point about who he was, and that's what I want to say today. We're, we're going to read the text, and, now, and I'm going to make a few comments, and then I want to talk about how um, one of the worst interpretations I've ever heard about this text, uh, because this is a this is a text that some have tried to use to totally turn the Jesus narrative on its head. So let, let's read. On their return, the apostles told him that they, uh, what, all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him. And he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, uh, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no, no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd, and they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. So that's the narrative as it comes to us in the Gospel of Luke. And we see the basically the same narrative in the other Gospels. There's a few added details that we see in the other Gospels, but they all basically tell the same story. And what's interesting about this story is that this is not the only time that this happens. Mark records for us that, that there was another time when he fed about 4,000 people. And that's not a second retelling of this same narrative with just a different number. Mark tells us that he did it twice, that there was definitely at least two times that Jesus fed large groups of people and this affected his following. The people that were around followed Jesus because he was able to feed them essentially out of nothing. Uh, and it demonstrated his divinity. It also demonstrated, we see over in John's gospel, uh, a willingness of some people to follow him simply for what he could give them rather than following him because he was son of God, because he was righteous, because he was the Messiah. Some people followed him simply because their bellies were full. That's what the, the text tells us. Um, but this, again, this narrative is so important. There's so, it, it, it's in every one of the gospels. Jesus did this more than once, uh, certainly at least twice, could have done it more than that. Of course, the gospels, uh, John tells us that not everything Jesus ever did is written in the gospels for us because there's so much that happened in his ministerial life that we, th that it couldn't all be written down. This might be one example of something that he did several times. And, um, what does it tell us about him? Well, it tells us about his divinity. It tells us that Jesus Christ can take something, uh, or rather can make something out of nothing. This is a very um, 
important aspect of what it means to be God. When we go back to Genesis 1, we see the Bible say that God spoke the world into existence, that he spoke the, the every day. It says, and God said, let there be, and there was. And that, that references the, the divinity of God. And this is an example of Christ. And somebody says, well, he's not making something out of nothing. He's, he's got five loaves and two fish. He's, he's multiplying. Yes, but to multiply, he's having to multiply out of out of nothing. You, 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 none of us could take two fish and make four fish. None of us could take two fish and make enough fish for 5,000 people because there has to be other material for us to make something. And we don't have the power to make a fish anyway. We don't have that ability. But Christ can make fish and bread essentially multiply out of nothing, which is a statement of his divinity. Now, I mentioned earlier, I've heard a really bad interpretation of this, and it was from um, textual scholar, John Dominic Crossum. John Dominic Crossum is, um, he is a textual scholar. He's what we might refer to as a higher critical scholar, meaning that um, he doesn't just uh, investigate the text for uh, things like textual variation and things like that. That's what's sometimes called lower criticism or textual criticism. Higher criticism looks to the question of whether or not the, the things that happen in the Bible are actually true. And there's a group called the Jesus Seminar, and John Dominic Crossman is a part of that. And they get together and they discuss the historicity of the statements made in the Bible. And much of the New Testament, they would say, just didn't happen. They don't take it as the truth. Obviously, they would not believe the Bible is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. They would dismiss that out of hand. And I remember him teaching. It was, I think he was doing a debate with Dr. James White, and, and they were, the, the subject of feeding the 5,000 came up. And he said, this is not true. This is a parable. He, and, and the parable, according to across him, was that Jesus didn't make fish and bread out of nothing. He didn't create, multiply. He didn't create and multiply the fish and the bread. But what he did was he took people who had brought food, who had, and he convinced those who had to share with those who didn't have. And he has a very convincing uh, sort of narrative that he goes along with us. And in a sense, it becomes, if you interpret it that way, it becomes a great communist miracle where we see a group of people who have and we have a group of people who have not. And so the goal of Jesus is not to truly multiply bread and fish, but to multiply compassion in the hearts of the haves to share with the with the with those who have not. And again, it, it sounds great. It, it, it sounds, oh, what a wonderful thing that people who have would share with people who don't have. But the problem is that's not what the text says. The text doesn't say anything like that. The text does not give that as an option of interpretation. You have to read that into the text. That is a textbook definition of eisegesis. Remember the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis is to read out of the text what's there, Eisegesis is to read into the text something that is not there. And John Dominic Crossum reads into this text the concept of sharing, which is not mentioned, the concept of people who have sharing with people who have not, that's not mentioned. And essentially, he robs Jesus in this picture of his divinity because He's saying this isn't something that Jesus did because he was divine. This is something that Jesus did because he was essentially a wise sage. He was a, he was a, a man of integrity and leadership, and he was convincing the haves to share with the have-nots. Again, I repudiate such an interpretation. I would say that's absolutely not in, in any way, shape, or form in line with what the text says. And it's a good example of misinterpreting the text because you do not believe in the supernatural. The people who come at the Bible with an anti-supernaturalistic presupposition uh, begin with the assumption that there just can't be miracles because they don't believe in miracles and therefore miracles cannot happen. And if you come at this with, with that presupposition, then you're not going to really see what the text is saying. This text is a miracle. Jesus performed a miracle. He was a miracle worker. Why? Because he was God in the flesh. He was the God-man. 
And this is one of the many texts that reminds us. In fact, if you go further down in Luke chapter 9, we get to the transfiguration, which is a picture of Jesus's divinity, where he, uh, for a moment in time, the glory of Christ shone for his, uh, his uh, inner group of disciples to see. We should never question or never doubt for a second the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is demonstrated in his miracles and uh, one of the greatest being the feeding of 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. So I hope uh, this was helpful to you. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. I hope these daily Bible studies continue to be a blessing to you. Please, if you would, take a moment to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our page if you haven't done that already. It helps us to reach a wider audience. Again, thank you for watching Coffee with a Calvinist. My name is Keith Foskey, and I am a Calvinist. May God bless you.